Let me open in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, I stand in humble adoration and praise of you this morning for who you are, for all that you've done in my life, for all that you've done in all of our lives, for all that you've done in this great nation, the United States of America. And I just thank you, Lord. I ask that you would uh, grant me wisdom this morning, that you would help me discern and understand what you have me say. I know that you have you've given me things over the last couple of weeks, and I'm so eternally grateful for that. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, you would step in, that it would be you speaking, and that you would uh, enlighten and touch our hearts and minds Lord, that we would sense and know your purpose, your presence, uh, and your glory to be established in our lives. And just thank you for the uh, humble opportunity I have uh, to be your servant this morning. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start off by asking you some questions this morning. And I don't want you to give me an answer. It's pretty neat, isn't it? It means you don't have any challenge. There's nothing you have to do because of what I'm going to ask you. But, oh, yeah, there is. Because the questions I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to take with you today. And over the next few days, and especially between now and the 4th, I want you to really ponder them and, and answer honestly what you believe the answer needs to be for you. And I'm not, asking, I'm not asking these questions so that you can give a one-word answer. And that seems to be that what we do sometimes just to make it short, sweet, and to the point. But I want you to, I want you to go beyond just a one-word answer. I want, you to, I want you to delve into this. I want you to think about what I'm going to ask you. And then... Once you sense and know what you believe is the fullness of that question, do something about it. Just do something about it. The question that I have for you, one of them this morning, is what are you standing for this morning? What are you standing for this morning? See, now I could, I could add a lot to that, you know, sort of, Filter it so that you've got more to think about in it. I'm not going to do that. That's what I want you to do. What are you standing for this morning? And maybe even a better question, once you have that one, is what are you willing to stand for in your life? What are you willing to stand for? What are you ready to sacrifice? See, I don't want to do that. I don't want to amplify this. I want you to think about it. What are your convictions based on this morning? You all, we all have beliefs. We all have convictions that we stand by, that we try to live in our lives. What are your convictions based on? Another good question this morning is, how real is the Word of God to you? How real is the Word of God to you? You're going to hear some things this morning, some evidence of how real the Word of God is in our founding fathers' lives. But how about you? How real is the Word of God to you? How about this one? Is sin just a three-letter word? Is it just a three-letter word? Well, I'll ask one more. I have several, but I'm, I'll, I'll leave it at this next one. What are you willing to do for Jesus today? What are you willing to do for Jesus today? Those are good questions. I believe those are questions that deserve an answer. They're not questions that you can pick up out of a book necessarily, they're questions that you have to determine about your own life and where you stand and where you want to go and what your walk is. 
I want to thank Pastor Jerry for the opportunity of speaking this morning. It's always an honor uh, for, to, uh, to be asked to speak, and uh, I, just, uh, I just thank him for that, and I certainly give all praise, honor, and glory to Jesus Christ for my salvation and for the work that he's done in my life and continues to do. He gets all of the praise and thanks from me. <clears throat> Scripture in Proverbs 14, 34 <clears throat> says this. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I want you to mull over that scripture for the next few minutes. And what I want you to do is I want you to think of, of it in, in relationship to how you feel about it, what it means to you. But I want, as I speak about the early founding fathers and about their principles and the things that, that helped to develop our nation, I want you to continue to think about that scripture and how it applied to their lives and the reason they did the things they did and the, the things that they said and how those things all match up with this very wonderful scripture, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And then we're going to come back to it at the very end this morning, which is not going to be that long, by the way. Oh, that's good. <clears throat> I didn't know I had an hour. <clears throat> I, I, I'm just joking with you, and I know that I know that some of you have to go home and get food and all of those good things. So uh, I'll, I won't take quite that long. <clears throat> As I spent time preparing uh, for this morning, uh, I read the stories of how our country began with godly men who understood the Word of God and desired to acknowledge and serve Him. As they struggled to form this new nation that would honor Him. And that was what they did. They created this nation or started or founded this nation to honor him. And the evidence is very clear of that. I kept seeing as I, as I studied over the last couple of weeks, Proverbs 14, 34, and the powerful truth of that simple, uh, the simple wisdom there, which so proud, to me profoundly illustrates the glory of God and the shame of sinful man. Clearly, the hand of God was, and I believe still is, on this nation that we call the United States of America. But as we Christians must understand that, but we as Christians must understand that God is calling us this morning to wake up. I don't know about you, but I see it constantly everywhere I go. We have slumbered while sin runs amok across our land. And it's time we understand that and understand what we need to do to, to, bring some correction, and to get us back on a, a standard that helps us to uh, bless and honor God. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17, Paul warns them, the, the early church, against evil and the need to expose sin. He said this, and I'll start with this part. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. But understand what the will of the Lord is. How many of you have had somebody come up to you and say, do you know what the will of the Lord is for your life? I've had that ask me. A bunch of times, and probably because they just looking at me, they had no clue. <laughs> no, that's, that, that may not be true. But, but I think it's a good, healthy question that we need to be asking ourselves. Do we know the will of God in our lives? Well, as, as Christians, there are basic tenets that we follow in God's word. But, but, what, but is there anything that goes beyond that? Is there some special thing that God wants to do in our lives? We want to be in his will, don't we? Okay, And if we want to be in his will, what do we have to do? We have to ask him. And we ask him expecting that he's going to give us an answer. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to ask for God's direction for this nation and what he wants us to do to wake up, quit lounging around thinking somebody else is going to do it, and let's do it. Let's do what God wants us to do. America stands without equal today as a beacon of hope and freedom in a hurting world, in spite of the failures, our failures before God. 
Our founding fathers delivered to us a system of government that has enjoyed unprecedented, unprecedented success. We are now the world's longest ongoing constitutional republic. Approaching 250 years under one form of government is an accomplishment unknown among contemporary nations. And I say to that, to God be the glory, great things he has done, and how infinite his grace and mercy in our lives. Amen. I am first and foremost a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I am also a dyed-in-the-wool patriot. From the top of my bald, almost bald head to the soles of my feet, I love this country and proudly salute the American flag because I know what it has cost us to have the freedoms that we possess. After 20 years in the military of serving in a uh, specialty where I had to go out and care for those guys that died on the battlefield, that died in service of their country, I know what the cost is for the freedoms that we possess today. Our nation has not been slack ever in stepping forward to help those who could not help themselves. For helping liberate foreign lands from tyrants, dictators, and conquerors. And the only thing that we have ever asked in return is enough ground to bury our dead and those that gave their life for that particular battle or conflict. For all that our country is, has done in the world today, my heart still aches for how far we have drifted from our Christian beginnings. On July the 4th, 1776, the forefathers of our nation set upon a course and forged a direction that would reverberate throughout the world. It sent shockwaves around the world. This course would lead our nation to offer unforeseen levels of hope, prosperity, and freedom to an amazing tapestry of people and nations. The American Revolution was truly revolutionary. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people was a very radical concept. I mean, even today we think about it, think, whoa, that's, that's radical stuff. Never had that been done before to the full extent that it was being accomplished in those early days. No one could have dreamed of the impact that it would have and nowhere else had such an idea ever existed before. While our forefathers set forth the ideal of what this nation could become, it was immensely more difficult to carry it out and ensure, and ensure it for all men and women. In fact, I believe that it is still a profound task that continues to this very day. The greatness of the American Revolution was this. A foundation was laid that would allow for freedom and liberty and this foundation could be built upon to lift this nation to its highest ideals. And the amazing thing to me is that the mortar that would hold this foundation together would be the word of God and a deep desire to place him first in every aspect of the nation that they were building. That's the amazing thing to me. How, how everything was being put together with God as the mortar, with God holding it together and binding it solidly so that it wasn't going to come apart. It was, it was important enough that they issued a caution, the forefathers did, that bears more significance today and a warning for us than it did then. They said this. They said that if we were to lose our religion and morality, our foundation would surely crumble. I believe there's very great danger of that today in our nation. Always on the hearts and minds of our forefathers was the need to proclaim God, to live out his precepts, and to bring him glory. Think about that. No other motive. No, no big lofty things about me or you or, or, or things. It was simply living out God's precepts and bringing him glory. As we study the founding of the United States, one thing that you can't help but encounter is the faith of our forefathers. I've read extensively, and, and I am I'm constantly amazed at the things our forefathers said about liberty and about service to God. Thomas Jefferson, in his 1781 notes to the state of Virginia, wrote this. He said, God who gave us life, gave us liberty, 
And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed the, their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of people that these liberties are the gift of God? That they are not to be violated but with his wrath? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. A man of great wisdom and insight that understood what needed to be done to put God first. I believe that he had a faith and a fear of God and certainly a fear of God's wrath for those who sinned. Listen to Patrick Henry. He was writing this after pushing through the anti-British Stamp Act resolve in May of 1765. He said, whether this will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which a gracious God hath bestowed on us. All depends on what the people do with a gracious God. If they are wise, they will be great and happy. If they are of a contrary character, they will be miserable. Righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. Righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. Reader, he said, whoever thou art, remember this. And in thy sphere, practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others. Practice virtue. Wow. And not only practice it, but encourage other people in the same thing. He, Patrick Henry also made this very bold statement. He said, the Bible is worth all the other books which have ever been printed. Now, you've got to stop and think about that a second, okay? You're, you're talking about well-educated men, <coughs> scholarly men that read books from all over the world. They, they read concepts and philosophies and, and principles that others around the world had written some tried and true, others still vague and weren't sure if they were right or not, but they read them all. They had a huge wealth of knowledge when it came to nation building, to government, how the government's supposed to run. And of all those things that Patrick Henry could have said, boy, now this is a really good book. How many of you said, this is a really good book about some other book besides the Bible? I have, I'll admit, I've said that. But his words, the Bible is worth all the other books which have ever been printed. And every one of you just about either has access to this morning or you have in your lap that word of God that's more important and is, is better than any other book that's been printed. That's awesome. I could just let you go now, let you go home and read the rest of the day, right? <laughs> nah, not yet. Not going to do that. Patrick Henry, I believe, knew where the blessings came from and the ob obligation to exercise them for good or suffer if they didn't. At the end of that divinely appointed day on July the 4th, Samuel Adams, good old Samuel Adams, one of the most outspoken and fearless leaders, wrote this. He said, We have this day restored the sovereign to whom alone men ought to be obedient. Wow. He reigns in heaven and from the rising to the setting sun, may his kingdom come. A man who understood the fullness of who God was and the kingdom that, that he had established. As the Second Continental Congress debated severing ties with Great Britain and forming a new nation, there were many underlying issues that would quickly, quickly need to be decided. How would this infant nation preserve freedom from Britain and other nations that might try imposing their will on America? What principles of law and government would her constitution form? How would she view and treat the rest of the world now that she was one of them, a nation striving to exist? These and many more issues weighed heavily on their hearts. Fortunately for them, and for us, by the way, the sources of those answers had already been adopted and its principles interwoven into the 13 colonies. The source? It's right here. This book that we all have in our laps, this book that they used and knew that they could go to for the wisdom to handle all of those situations and many more that would come about because of the development of this nation. Just as it was the foundation of our fledgling nation, it is still the only real truth 
which will hold our nation together. So when people say, well, what, what, what's going to happen in our nation? What can we do? How can we turn this around? How can we get back where we need to be? Where do you want to start? You know, where do you want to start? It's here. We have to find it. But when, it's not enough to just find it and know it up here. We've got to put it here, and then we've got to apply it in our lives so that it makes the change that it needs to, and it makes people stand up and pay attention and say, whoa, wait a minute, I've never heard that before. Why, how do, why is this person saying these things? But they admire your life because you're standing up for what you believe is right. You're standing up for something that can't be, that can't be erased or considered erroneous by anyone else unless they're... I won't go there. (laughs) I'll just leave that where it's supposed to be. Uh, They're 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 thinking entirely different. Okay. Um, So that's still the only real truth. In early American in in early America, children were taught using the New England Primer. Anybody ever heard of the New England Primer? Three, four, five. Okay. Um, It's not. It's you can get. Uh, reproductions of it now, but you can't you can't get any of the originals. Obviously, they're probably worth a lot of money. Anyway, included in this New England primer that every school child had and carried with them every day to and from school at home, read it at home, parents read it at home. Everybody understood what was in the New England primer. Included in the New England primer were the names of all of the books of the Old and New Testament. The Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Westminster Catechism. All of these things, amazing in one tiny little book that they could could go to and study from. The Primer, second best-selling book in the colonies, the Bible being number one, taught children the ABCs using biblical truths. Let me give you just a couple of examples. A... In Adam's fall, we sinned all. How much simpler can that get, huh? What happened with Adam is sin for everybody. A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. B, thy life amend, this book attend. This one, right here. C, Christ crucified for sinners died. Such profound truths in simple, four simple words that helps any child understand who Jesus is and what he wanted to do in their lives. To understand the big picture of who God was. Daniel Webster, statesman, lawyer, orator, said of the Bible, if we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our posterity neglect its instruction and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. I love what Helen Keller said of the Bible. She said, unless we form the habit of going to the Bible in bright moments, as well as in trouble, we cannot fully respond to its consolations because we lack equilibrium between light and darkness. In other words, we don't understand lightness and darkness apart from the Word of God that shows us plainly what lightness and darkness are. We have no equilibrium if we're not depending on the Word of God to show us the difference between Light and dark, truth and sin. Dr. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration, summed up best the need for Bible education in a pamphlet that he wrote listing 12 reasons the Bible needed to be the central textbook in schools. I don't have all 12 of those. I found three or four. I'm not even going to cover those because he really said some neat things about how important it was to have uh, the Bible in the schools. But he wrote this. He said, I lament that we waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. Hey, huh? Think about how full our prisons are today, overflowing. And, and most of the people in there have never heard anything from the Bible 
They've never understood any of the moral truths that are there. That's the reason they're where they are, most of them. Okay? He said, I lament that we waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. We neglect the only means of establishing and perpetuating our Republican forms of government. That is, the universal education of our youth in the pr principles of Christianity by means of the Bible. And then he, he just named two or three things he said. If they have that, there's equality among mankind. There is respect for just laws. There is sober and frugal virtues understood. Things that you don't see too much going on in our country today. No truer words could have been smoke, spoken by Dr. Rush. So, how did we go from a nation with a powerful understanding and a belief in a sovereign God who reigns over the affairs of men to a nation that is ready to ignore and nullify his person, his power, and his word. How did we get to that point where at one point we were right where we needed to be? We were moving forward with all of the things that, that God wanted us to do, and we were understanding what it meant to serve him. Supposedly, what we have lived and believed in our thousands of years about the nature and work of God, now suddenly it isn't relevant anymore? Come on. What was true for hundreds of years about marriage and homosexuality and perversions, the sanctity of life and sin, those things obviously are not, no longer true, or they are true, but they're not professed today. It's all been flip-flopped. It's all been turned around. I got news for you. <clears throat> Nothing's really changed. God's not changed, has he? No, wait a minute. Now, has God changed? Has he decided that he's going to accept society's new way of thinking and say, well, that's okay. Let's just, let's just do that. Let's just... We'll, the society will be different now. We won't have these stringent rules that we've got to live by and all of that. Nope. Not at all. The word's still here, isn't it? It's still viable for our lives today. God's not changed, nor has his word. So it must be mankind that, turns his back, that has turned his back on a holy God. We were not once a nation that enjoyed the respect of the world because we stood for what was true and right. Now, not only are we disrespected, but our lack of standards and morality has drug other nations into the same abyss that we're in. We're the ones that said in 1973 that it's okay to kill a baby. The next thing you know, every nation around the world, most of them, is doing the same thing. Well, America did that. Well, now they're saying... It must be okay for two men or two women to get married. They're doing it in America now, so let's do it. And you see laws being changed in every nation. You see a total disrespect for life in nations that are, that are euthanizing senior citizens because they don't consider them to be valuable parts of society anymore. Because of human nature... Men tend to want to be ruled and cared for rather than to take responsibility and cherish liberty. Well, let's just let somebody else do it. I want somebody to take care of me, give me everything I want, and I don't have to do anything for it. Because of human nature, tyranny from time to time raises its ugly head and men will endure a long reign of abuses and usurpations. But eventually, enough is enough. It's time to take a stand. And I'm telling you this morning, it's time to take a stand. It's time to say enough is enough is enough. This stupid, stinking thinking, some of these things that the humanists are, are putting out there, and it's time for us to say, no, that's not right. I heard a statistic a couple of weeks ago. Don't know who it was from. <clears throat> I got so mad at it that I couldn't even think about who was saying it. But it was on TV. It was on TV. He said that fully 
70% of Americans believe that same-sex marriage is okay. Yeah. And that's when I got mad. And I thought, Lord, confuse that man. I mean, not only confuse him, but help everybody that heard that, including me, to be able to forget it because it's not true. None of that, none of that is true. If we believe that the hand of God and his blessings and wisdom was on the colonies of America, then we have to believe that he ordained the happenings that resulted in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, and subsequent amendments to those Bill of Rights. And all of these documents are under attack today and or are being ignored by those who are looking to create a new society devoid of God that worships man. A lot of people that you listen to today, you can hear it in what they say. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about what's important to me. And you don't, don't offend me by saying things that would make me feel bad. Hmm. These documents and the men who labored over them were God-driven men. God-driven. This nation was ordained by God, I believe, for a divine purpose. You agree with that? Yes. Why would he create a nation 243 years ago and then say, okay, that was a waste of time. Let's do something else. No. I believe God's hand is still on this nation, and I believe that God is saying, wake up, guys. Let's get with it. Let's, let's get with the program and put this place this nation back where it needs to be again. Those who think otherwise have failed to see the intercession of God at every step of our history. Or they choose to harden their hearts, instead believing that man by his sweat, ingenuity, and wisdom has made America successful. Those who ignore God and rely on their self or a tyrannical, out-of-control government are the cause of the decline in America today. It's self and it's an out-of-control government that needs to be put back in order again. Our governing documents were infused with, with uh, core values based on revelation from the word of God that ensured our everlasting dependence on him. While we have a lot to admire and love and be thankful for in being able to call America our home, our nation is rapidly drifting away from its biblical foundation. Our freedom to serve God and to promote the gospel in our land is disintegrating. We are engaged in a great spiritual battle that threatens our country, our families, and our lives this very day. I believe we have a responsibility as believers in Jesus to fulfill his call to be salt and light in the world. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, it says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I believe we need to take seriously our responsibility to put God first, not only in our homes, not only in our communities, but also in our national affairs. We have to be active salt and light to a world that is crumbling all around us. And they have to be able to see that and understand what motivates us to say and do the things that we do? By the way, I would ask that as you pray over the next couple of weeks and pray for our nation, that you pray specifically, specifically for wisdom, for direction, and for the enemy to be bound in this whole process of the new uh, Supreme Court justice. That has to happen. It really has to happen. I, I know God's in charge, and I just am, I'm beseeching God that, that he will blind the eyes of those that 
they, they do not want another conservative on the court. That has to happen. And I pray that, I ask that you would pray in that regard. All right, I'm nearly through. I promise, I am. It's pretty good, too. In one of the Peanuts comic strips, Linus says to Charlie Brown, I don't like to face problems head on. I think the best way to solve problems is to avoid them. This is a philosophy of mine, he said. No problem is too big or complicated that it can't be run away from. Charlie Brown, in his typical naivety, asked this. He said, what if everyone was like you? What if everyone in the whole world suddenly decided to run away from his problems? Linus replies, well, at least we would all be running in the same direction. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that is funny. The, the problem I see with it is that a lot of the problems that we have in America are being ignored or run from. We need to stop ignoring the problems in America. We need to quit running in the opposite direction and start collectively tackling those, those issues. Sin abounds and Christians are looking the other way. That's part, probably, that, you know, that's what, pretty much what Charlie Brown's saying here. He's saying, well, let's just let it go. Let somebody else take care of it. We cannot join a mass exodus from involvement and be true to our faith. You cannot exit and do nothing when your faith says just the opposite. The way of the cross and the loyalty to the, key, to the flag, citizenship in the kingdom of God, uh, and patriotism in the kingdom of our nation inevitably interact in our lives together. We as followers of Christ cannot escape the mandate established by God of what ought to be done in relationship to the social order and its government. We can't escape the mandate established by him. I started with Proverbs 14, 34, which said, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Did you see what happens when men act according to divine or moral law? Did you, did you understand that when you were hearing all of these things about these men and women that, that said, Yea, God? God exalted them. God exalted the nation because of what they were doing. That is righteousness, and it exalts or lifts up a nation, and God blesses it. We've seen the evidence of that. We've seen it in the past. I want to see it again. I want to see the full fruit of God's blessings on this nation. Sin discredits or disgraces any people, and God turns his back on him. I want to give you a, a closing example of this very simple scripture, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, we have a very clear and amplified understanding of this proverb's meaning. Just four verses. I'm not going to read that whole chapter, but I'm gonna, I, wanna, I just want to isolate four verses because I want you to see what exalts and what's a reproach. Okay? The first two are from De Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 2. It says this, And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. That's righteousness. Doing the will of God, obeying God, and being lifted up because of that. Everything that you say and do is exalted before Almighty God. That's righteousness. The last two verses are from Deuteronomy chapter 28 again, verse 15 and verse 20. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds. 
because you have forsaken me. I want the first one. I want the exalting. I want the righteousness that comes with doing what God's telling us to do. Obedience. Not doing what I want to do and suffering destruction because of it. Brothers and sisters, this morning it's simple. What are we going to do individually and collectively from this point forward with the things that we understand, the things of God's word, the things that drive us, the things that motivate us, the things that God wants us to do to change this nation back to where it was. Our nation and our God deserve an answer and a commitment and action. It's up to you individually to carry that out. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you this morning for blessing our nation for 243 years and for the freedoms that we enjoy because of your blessings. Lord, may we continually remember your generosity, your blessings, and your grace as we observe this day of remembering what you accomplished through our founders. We humbly ask, Lord, that you would forgive us for our disobedience in not obeying your word and its precepts and promises to us. We ask that you would forgive us for not seeking you for wisdom and direction in regard to our personal walk and the work of restoration in our country. We pray, Lord, that you would help us be diligent in being salt and light to those around us and help us be ambassadors to share your love and gospel wherever we go. Father, we ask your protection on the men and women who serve around the globe and keep them safe, granting them wisdom for the tough choices that they have to make. Please return them safely to our shores and to their families. Ask, Lord, that you would give wisdom to all government authorities and grant them hearts that desire to serve you in all their deliberations. Help them sense and know what's right and good and decent for our nation. Our trust is in you, Lord. Grant us guidance and courage as we work together to bless and honor you as one nation under God. And I ask that in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless America.